Hey, I've been around. I've seen many cable reviews over the years. And some reviewers present their conclusions like, you know, very matter of factly, like, yes, cables do absolutely sound different. And this is a given. There's no doubt about it at all. And here are my conclusions. And others are like, yes, I know this is a controversial subject and I'm really sorry. If anyone is offended by my review, please don't beat me up too severely. This is what I think though. And then of course, there are the others. And do I really need to tell you what they think of cable reviews? Well, from my perspective, evaluating all audio gear is way more subjective than the so-called science and measurement people will admit. They like to claim that all this subjective stuff is made up nonsense by delusional audiophiles and manipulative hi-fi dealers and manufacturers. And to that crowd I say, go jump in a lake. Now my earliest memory of people starting to discuss cables was when Monster Cable began marketing the products during the 1980s. And I remember hearing salespeople actually explaining why Monster Cables were a worthwhile investment by using the analogy of a garden hose. The cheap thin wire we'd been using for years was like a very narrow pipe that restricted the flow of water. And that a hose with a wider diameter would allow the water or music to flow much easier. It was mostly total nonsense, but back then it made sense, right? That was much easier to explain and understand than skin effect, resistance, inductance, or the difference between stranded, solid core, copper, and silver wire. And Monster Cable did a fantastic job marketing their products. Firstly, by making them see-through, so buyers could actually see the thicker braided wire inside. And secondly, by offering very fat markups to retailers, giving them the opportunity to add nice additional profit to each sale. Salesmen were motivated to make sure that every set of new speakers or an amplifier or receiver that went out the door would include a set of monster cables as well. In the early 1980s, an average set of monster cables were priced at around $55, and that was significant because customers were accustomed to the retailers just throwing in a couple of lengths of free 16-gauge zip cord off a big spool in the back of the store. A very profound moment in my life as an enthusiast was around 1996 when I was living in England. There was a local hi-fi retailer in Dunstable called Technosound. And I'd upgraded my system with some RCAM electronics and Haybrook speakers. And the owner sent me home one weekend with several pairs of AudioQuest speaker cables inside a kind of a plastic briefcase home audition kit. And as I tried out each pair with my new system, I definitely could hear a difference between the four sets of cables. And I ended up choosing the Cobalt 2 cables because I preferred how they sounded in my new system. And I had to spend, I spent over 200 pounds on that pair, which to me at the time was incomprehensible. But I could not unhear the difference that I'd experienced. And I couldn't go back to my old speaker wires. Geez, that happens to me a lot. And I've read the reviews and seen the videos by individuals that, that claim to use science when measuring audio cables and usually come to the conclusion that if they can't measure any significant difference between their, with their, using their instruments between a $5 cable and a $1,000 one, then there is absolutely no difference. Now, my personal experience tells me that's wrong. My question to the skeptics is, have you actually put in the time and effort to methodically compare several pairs of speaker cables? That means using the same music tracks, source, amp, and speakers, and swapping the cables out, listening, taking detailed notes of what you noticed in the treble, mids, bass, soundstage depth, uh, imaging, whatever you believe is relevant, then swapping them with another set of cables, listening to the same tracks, taking more notes, swapping them again, listening, more notes, 
And then a few days later, or even a weeks later, do it all again. You could use some different music tracks, but still noting your impressions, and then, then go and compare the new notes with what you described earlier. Are they consistent? Did you hear similar results? Are, are they wildly different? And then you could even do it again a week or two later. See, and that's what I usually do in my evaluations. I've heard the rebuttal, well, it's all stupid nonsense, so it's all pointless to even try. Or, as someone just told me, I did all that stuff back when I was young. Been there, done that. And I, listen, I strongly urge you to try it now. And you may be surprised by what you discover. I was actually taken aback with my results. It's very intriguing. I'm not alone in the belief that when it comes to sound, there are limits to what even the most sensitive measuring instruments can detect. And if you've been listening to music through above average hi-fi gear for a while, you know that, you know that in your gut. Is it possible that all the measurement first science crowd are just measuring the wrong thing? Or that our incredibly complex hearing mechanisms cannot be matched by current technology? Yes, it's possible. Now, is comparing and evaluating cables as much fun as evaluating speakers, amplifiers, and turntables, or even DACs? Uh, no. Sometimes it just feels more like work. Why? Well, besides all the bending over and crawling and squatting and poking around behind your gear, from my experience, you really have to concentrate and focus more when evaluating cables. As with all things, when you start looking for differences, you will probably find them. For example, you can look at a nice LED TV and think, hey, that has a great picture quality. And then later on, you could look at a nice OLED TV and say the same thing. But when you position the screen side by side and compare them, then you will begin to notice the differences and most likely express a preference between the two. So it makes sense. Well then, why don't you perform a double-blind ABX test then? Well, they're not that easy to perform. And it's just, this debate has been around for decades. And you, that's why you, and you rarely see them on YouTube. Why? Well, go to the Wikipedia page link I posted below to see what is actually involved in performing one. And my conclusions have been carefully considered and mulled over using my aging but still above average brain. Why am I making this video, you may ask. Well, last February at the Florida Audio Expo, I met John from AudioShield, who was demonstrating some really nice Vandenhall products. And I told him I was interested in trying out their stuff. And then shortly afterwards, I received a box containing some of their cables to evaluate. And it's been well over six months now and I must commend John on his extraordinary patience. Over the past few years, my price limit on a pair of speaker cables has been around about $100. And in my opinion, a, at a minimum, good cables should be well-made, durable, look good, easy to handle, and sonically, they shouldn't mess with the music, but rather transmit the music signal in a mostly unadulterated manner. But how do we even know what that means? All music playback systems alter the signal to one degree or another. My simple question is, is spending a bit more than usual on cables worth the extra expense? This three meter set of banana plug terminated Vandenhall Clearwater cables retail for $259. Now in today's world of hi-fi, that's really not a lot of money considering what other modern components can sell for. Additionally, enthusiasts tend to hold on to cables for many, many years. A good set of cables remain in the system even as a parade of speakers and amplifiers come and go. So good cables can be great investments because you will likely keep them for years rather than months. I'll be comparing the Clearwater cables to what I've been using in my systems for the past few years. 
And the speakers I will use are these, my old magnet pans. And the source will be coming from a blue sound node running through a hollow spring three deck into an air acoustics preamp. And I will be also be using a modern class AB topping LA90 for amplification. And it's rated at around 90 watts per channel into four ohms and the Maggie's are four ohm speakers. And some people have doubted that this little Chinese amp can power MagnaPan speakers adequately. I assure you, in my setup, it performs brilliantly. And I'll be making a video about the LA90 in the coming weeks. I've been happily using the Blue Jeans cables for months. Physically, they're on the thin side and they're very stiff, not that easy to work with. Terminating them yourself is more challenging than with a more flexible wire. But these came terminated with locking bananas, which I like very much. When comparing them sonically to the other cables, they're quite splashy and dynamic sounding. The high frequencies were clear and prominent, and there was an audible clarity and vividness that was nice up to a point, but at higher volumes, the soundstage felt compressed, and I detected some edginess and upper mid-range glare. My older garden hose looking monster cables, which I've had for a while, are physically hefty in weight compared to the others. They're not so easy to route in my setup due to their thickness and mass. I cut off their, the spade connectors and attached some bananas a while back. I don't like spade connectors. And these, in comparison, these overemphasized the high frequencies to my ears and they noticeably lacked in the lower frequency department. I was a bit disappointed with how they presented the music compared to the other cables. And they're really not my cup of tea. The big surprise was the $20 Monoprice set. They have a nice overall balance across the audio spectrum, but a bit strident and sibilant with high frequencies. They had pleasant mids and bass, and for 20 bucks, they're an amazing value. Now, I use them all the time when demoing gear that I'm selling, and that's not gonna change. Physically, they're not that great to use, as each side is made from two separate woven lengths of cables joined together every three feet by like four inches of clear shrink tubing. And they easily get twisted up and tangled, and also the black and red banana plug grips always became unscrewed, and I'd find them on the floor somewhere. The Vandenhall Clearwater feel like a quality product. I believe this style of cable is called shotgun style with the positive and negative sides kept separated and parallel. The nice feeling rubbery and flexible jacket is called Holoflex, which they claim is PVC and halogen free. And so the absence of those substances are said to improve sound quality long term. Compared to the other cables, they look much classier and are fantastic to handle. Very flexible and easy, easy to position around the back of an audio rack. And the banana plugs look like they could hold up for years of pushes and pulls. The only minor downside is that the jacket is the total opposite of slippery. Due to the grippy, rubbery material, it does sometimes snag when pulling it through tight spaces. It was immediately noticeable that the Vandenhall Clearwater cables presented the music in a fuller and richer manner. More depth, more sound stage, less forward and bright. They were smoother and, and, and more laid back and relaxed sounding as well compared to the others. I can and have lived happily with my old cables for years. Except, I think, the Monster Powerline 2s. I don't know where the bass went with those. So after careful consideration of their sonic and physical properties, the Vandenhall Clearwater were my clear favorite with this particular system. I have no idea how they do it, but to my ears, they added a bit of refinement and ease to the music I was listening to. To me, they're definitely worth the extra expense 
and I plan to acquire a pair of Clearwaters in the near future. You know, I started this channel over two and a half years ago, and besides monetizing the channel, I haven't asked my viewers for any financial support. So you know, as I approach retirement in a few years at my regular day job, I have a dream to make this channel into a full-time gig one day. But that won't be possible without the help from generous viewers like you. And I would like, to, you know, I could produce much more content if I just had the time. So what I'm offering for a mere $3 a month is early and ad-free access to my new videos and some exclusive My Own Devices content. So please visit patreon.com, My Own Devices, to join me. Thanks.